Hello, and welcome to the ELEC's virtual pre-conference, Library Preservation Today. This is a three-part virtual pre-conference being held this week, with the next two sessions on Tuesday and Wednesday at the same time. I'm Vicki Grzynski, the Continuing Education Assistant in the ELEC's office. Today's session is called Introduction to Library Preservation. Our presenter today is Karen E. K. Brown. Karen Brown is a preservation librarian for the University at Albany SUNY, a position she has held since 2001. In this capacity, she is responsible for managing the preservation laboratory, including budget, grant programs, staffing, materials repair and reformatting, and equipment maintenance, the repair and conservation of collections for the university libraries, managing the library's brittle and irreparable books program, including selection, microfilming, photocopying, and scanning, participating in emergency preparedness and response, environmental control, staff training, and other preventative activities, coordinating preservation initiatives with other departments and units, and participating in digital initiatives, including serving as a resource person for the preservation of digital assets. Karen holds a Bachelor of Fine Arts from the Cooper Union in New York City and a Master of Art Conservation from Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. After working for five years as a conservator for the Provincial Archives of New Brunswick in Fredericton, New Brunswick, she went on to complete her MLIS at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Prior to coming to Albany, Karen was the Field Service Representative at the Northeast Document Conservation Center in Andover, Massachusetts from 1997 to 2001. She is a member of the American Institute for Art and Historic Artifacts and the American Library Association. Before we get started, there are a few things uh, I'd like the audience to keep in mind for today's preservation, or today's presentation, excuse me. If you wish to comment on today's presentation using Twitter, you may use the hashtag you see in the bottom left of the screen. It's the official Twitter hashtag for all Alex events at ALA Annual Conference in Las Vegas. We won't be monitoring the Twitter feed during the session, but feel free to use it to chat amongst yourselves. If you have questions for the presenters, please type them into the question box on your screen. We have set aside some time at the end of the presentation for questions. Questions that we can't get to will be answered offline and the answers will be sent to all attendees. Today's webinar does not have interactive chat capabilities, so if you do have questions, please use the question box. If you want to reduce the toolbar on your screen, you can click on the red arrow and it will um, collapse. This webinar is being recorded and you will receive an email with links to the recording, the presentation slides, and an evaluation within the next two business days. Finally, we hope you will take the time to fill out the evaluation form that will be sent to you after this session, since it will be used by the committee to plan future events. With that, I will turn the presentation over to Karen. There may be a slight delay. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the first of three webinars that we will be offering this week based on the ELEX Fundamentals of Preservation online course. Today's program, Library Preservation Today, Introduction to Library Preservation, will provide insights into how to establish a preservation program based on your institutional size and mission. I'm going to give you a bit of history on library preservation in the U.S. and talk about where we might be in the years to come. The goal will be to help you understand the value of preservation as a formal library function and to gain some insight into preservation planning. I want us all to get a sense of who's participating in today's event so we can try to tailor, even to some small degree in this online environment, our thoughts and ideas about library preservation programs and uh, to try to address uh, the audience's uh, interests and needs. So we're going to uh, ask a question. You can see we've got a poll. We're going to start it now. There might be a slight delay while we open this up. Okay, 
let's see. All right, so we're asking you to briefly characterize your current preservation program, and please select only one. So the first is zilch, you don't have one. The second is a few activities, but nothing that's really organized. The third is maybe, you know, staff have preservation responsibilities, and uh, many are involved. Uh, the program's well established, needs some updating. This program today should help with that as well. And finally, our program uh, runs well meeting organizational needs. So let's see, I'm watching the poll. We've got about 92% voting. We'll give it another three or four seconds. All right. OK, I think we can close the poll. And let's have a look at the results and see what we've got. OK, well, it looks like 50% um, are, have a few activities, but nothing that's really organized. So that tells me, you know, you've got things, you've done some projects, but you probably really don't have a program. Uh, below that, we have 25% saying you have a well-established program. It needs an update. I think we can help with that. We'll help get you thinking anyway about how to move uh, in a different direction if you think that's what you need to do. 17% say that you have people with preservation responsibilities. Uh, maybe many are involved uh, in implementing those policies and procedures, and that's excellent. Um, only 8% of you said zilch, um, and hopefully today it will give you some ideas about how to get started from ground zero. Nobody said that they had a program that runs well. So um, it seems like everyone's maybe looking for some new ideas. All right, let's move on in today's presentation. OK. All righty, thank you. All right, so let's first talk a little bit about the value of preservation. So this three-part virtual pre-conference is, is designed to try to communicate the understanding that preservation is an essential and integrated part of library operations. If your goal is to keep your collections in their original physical form or in some other usable way for as long as they are needed, then preservation is part of your organization's professional responsibilities, even if it isn't written into your mission or mandate, which of course it should be. Preservation efforts will help ensure that future generations of users can access the wealth of resources that we've so carefully identified, acquired, organized, given access to, stored, and made available for research. I know it's often difficult to sell the idea of collections preservation, I think because of a general feeling that such activities might compete for resources that folks think maybe is needed elsewhere. On the other hand, staff may have a very limited understanding of what preservation actually means or of practical ways to implement ideas for protecting collections. So I think this workshop series can really help address, help you address these challenges. Whether analog, that is physical collections of books, journals, maps, manuscripts, etc., or digital, library collections are an important part of society's collective memory, a society that depends on the cultural record to recount and capture the human experience. They help us understand our past, shape the present, and plan for the future. By protecting our collections, and making those sources readily accessible, we support learning and the advancement of society as a whole. But I know recorded history is fragile. Physical objects deteriorate, especially if they're poorly made. Electronic resources are also proving to be an enormous challenge with respect to preservation and assured access. But if we see value in our collections, then we will need to balance that value with the investment needed to keep them available for future use. So at every turn, I think we all need to consider, if we're running a preservation program or plan to, we need to consider the cost-benefit functions of preservation strategies and highlight how protection 
and prevention functions can and should save institutional resources. So before I race ahead, I want to clarify a little bit of terminology for you because terms like preservation and conservation are often confused and they can be confusing in context. The most authoritative definition of the term preservation comes from the American Institute for Conservation, or AIC. Their logo is on the top right corner. This is a national membership organization for conservation professionals. So they define um, preservation as the protection of cultural property through activities that minimize chemical and physical deterioration and damage and that prevent loss of informational content. So that's really very important. The information is often what it is we're trying to protect, especially in a library environment. Preservation, in my mind, is what I would call an inclusive term. In other words, it's comprised of a whole bunch of stuff. For example, policies, policies in whole or in part, principles and best practices and ethical considerations, also activities such as physical or chemical stabilization, reformatting, and that can include photocopying, digitization, or microfilm, emergency prevention, preparedness and response, as well as environmental monitoring and control, pest management and security of the facility and of the collections, to continue proper care and handling, education and training, attention to problems associated with exhibition and display, and even collection development activities, such as selection and resource sharing. And that's an awful lot, that's a lot of hats to be wearing. Um, and I'm going to say right now, if you don't have a program, you want to think about where to start, and you'll build your program over time, and you can plan for that growth in your program. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. So don't feel overwhelmed at this point. No matter where you are or what you're doing in terms of library collection preservation, I, I would like to remind everyone that the overriding philosophy for most library collections is to organize your preservation program with an emphasis on maintaining collections as a whole and focusing on preventing damage. It's much more cost effective to prevent damage via a benign environment, careful handling, or fixing links, uh, leaks as an example than it is to use remedial approaches to repair or recover material once damage has been done, even if it can be recovered at all. So remember, that's always got to be your emphasis in your program is to prevent damage. So many of you may be wondering, now, what is digital preservation? Well, the definition's a little bit different, but in many ways it's really a subset of preservation in the sense that the work we do here to maintain the integrity of digital collections is also a matter of managing. Managing the finances, selection, the workflow, procedures, etc. And of course working at the highest level to meet and even exceed all measures of quality. Now the skill sets of traditional preservation specialists and digital preservation specialists may differ in other ways and we're going to come back and talk about that a little bit later. In 2007, I was part of a working group spearheaded by Kathy Martiniak in the preservation and reformatting section of ALEX. And, and uh, we were asked to try and define digital preservation for use by ALA. And after several months of discussion and debate, we came up with three versions. A short one for when somebody needs a quick definition, and then a medium and a longer or more detailed deficient definition depending on what the situation demanded when someone needed a definition. Now I've got the short one here, and you can see that if you removed all the digital words, it could also be a, dig a, a definition for the care of analog collections. Anyway, if you want to see all three, the, uh, three definitions, the URL is here on the slide. And of course, on Wednesday, Peter Verheyen from Syracuse University will go into more detail in his session on digital preservation. A few other terms. Um, 
I, I have just this one last slide, I promise you, on terminology, because some of you may not have a sense of what the difference is between conservation and preservation, and these are words you've probably all heard before. Conservation is really um, the treatment or repair of individual items, and it's grounded in the history, technology, and science of materials and their response to the environment. Um, the conservation profession is really the research background of what is physically happening in our collections. And conservation treatment is most often considered with respect to those individual items. Now the term restoration is a term more often used in other fields such as the museum environment where the original appearance is sometimes pivotal to the value and understanding of an object. But using techniques, of course, that are reversible like water-based adhesives. Using replacement pigments or parts with, with some examination are obviously new materials, so you know what's original. And using methods and materials that don't damage what you have. These are all part of the ethical responsibility of all practicing preservation professionals. So I think uh, as long as you know that preservation and conservation aren't mutually exclusive terms, um, uh, and also that they, they both encompass a, a pretty wide range of activities associated with maintaining collections. But for libraries, the important note is that we're striving mostly against loss of the information. And while there are valued, unique items that will demand special attention, most holdings have value in the context of the collection as a whole, not as objects in and of themselves. All right, so we've moved past um, the, I, I think, the boring part. Uh, let's just, just go up to a, something a little bit more interesting, I hope. Uh, we get this under our belt. I think you'll see how it all comes together as we move forward. Um, I, I want to just give you a little bit of context before we start talking about library preservation today and possibly tomorrow uh, to just see where we've been over the past 100 years or so. The problem of deteriorating collections was first recognized over a hundred years ago, and that's in particular with the Brittle Book problem. Um, but even before that, we were creating durable book structures. Um, this was really one of the first preservation initiatives taken and is often still the, the backbone of many preservation programs today that's working with library binders. Now, prior to 1905, there were binders working for libraries, but it wasn't until then that ALA created a committee on behalf of the membership to work with the binding industry to specify what makes a durable book, which I thought was very interesting to find out. So over the next 25 years, um, standards uh, would be developed with the Library Binding Institute, uh, uh, then being formed in 1935. Now with all that, it really wasn't until 2000 that we had a national standard finally approved. So even that took almost 100 years. The first organization to really have a significant impact on library preservation activities in the U.S. was the Council on Library Resources, including the establishment of ALA's Library Technology Project, which explored and reported on research into adhesives, uh, pressure-sensitive tape, copying machines, and other equipment and supplies that could affect the preservation of library materials. They supported the work of a gentleman named William J. Barrow. He issued a report almost 20 years earlier in the 1930s describing the problem and origins of the Brittle Book Pages. So it was in the 1970s and 1980s that librarians worldwide focused their efforts on developing standards to create permanent paper. So instead of publishing books on paper that was going to become brittle and acidic and we'd have to invest in reformatting or reprinting, they thought, well, let's come up with paper that's good quality so we can uh, uh, put the problem off you know, for many, many years before we'd have to start worrying about what to do. So they worked on those permanent paper standards. It came out, the first one, before it was, the first one was in 1984. Um, uh, other approaches was, uh, I call a period of mass treatment, um, which included things like cooperative microfilming, and a lot of this support came through the National Endowment for the Humanities, um, and mass deacidification, 
Uh, these are just two examples. Now, since the turn of the 21st century digitization and how to preserve digital information, and now our current challenges and tools and, re and strategies for preserving information for future users are all really those digital challenges. Um, and of course, what we're dealing with now isn't just text, but also sound, video, born digital, and multimedia formats. So just to give you a quick overview about you know, where we've come over the last 100 years and what we've been able to accomplish. There we go. So we've got one more poll question. Um, I think we can go ahead and start this. Thank you. OK. So here we're asking you to tell us what your greatest preservation challenges are in your institution. And you can select more than one from this list. So is the first competition for resources? Or do you find you have a lack of awareness, maybe a need for training? Maybe your building is inadequate, and you don't have the right kind of space for protecting your collections. The fourth choice would be that you don't have a plan, or you're unsure of where to get started. And finally, you have digital assets uh, that might be in many forms, as I said, that you aren't sure how to protect. So please go ahead and vote, and we'll watch the progress until we've got as close to 100% as possible. And just give us an idea of what it is you're all facing at your institution. All right, we've got about 67%. We'll give you another 10 or 15 seconds here. All right. Good, we're up to 87%. All right. OK, I think we can close the poll there. Thanks, everybody. And let's just take a look at the results. Now, the majority of you have digital assets uh, that you're not sure how to protect. And so do I. So I would have selected that one, too. Um, half of you uh, have a lack of resources. Or uh, I'm sorry, half of you have a, uh, a problem maybe with a lack of awareness among staff about preservation needs maybe a need for training. And also, half of you said that where you're storing your material may not be adequate. 43%, as I suspected, would be high, although it's not as high as I thought it might be, was competition for resources. And 29% of you said that you have no plan or you're unsure of how to get started. OK, this is really good. So digital, a lot of digital. OK, a lot of physical problems. I hope some of you will be able to come to tomorrow's program on the environment. And we're going to talk again about training here. So all right, thank you very much. I think we're ready to move on. All right, so library preservation today. Let's think about where we are now. If I may venture to say, preservation specialists have come a long way in the past 50 years. And I feel quite strongly that while there's always something new to learn and ways to improve the work we do, that with respect to the care and preservation of traditional materials, we're pretty good at it. But as you all know, a lot has changed in the digital age. And we have a lot of questions about our priorities and how best to use our, to use our resources. I think it's fair to say right up front that our physical collections or legacy collections as some, has, has, as some have referred to them as, will be with us still for a long time. And even with mass digitization projects and amazing resources like the Digital Public of, uh, Library of America, the Happy Trust, and many, many other free online resources, our physical collections, in particular, our archival and special collections holdings, will remain an important resource and will continue to involve and need many specialists, including conservators, to keep them in usable condition or stabilizing them to allow for safe reformatting activities. Unique holdings, or those we might consider rare or valuable, will likely take precedent, precedence in terms of where we're going to invest, sometimes limited resources. They'll take precedence over general circulating materials, especially when there are 
many, many extant copies uh, held in other libraries or other collections uh, here in the U.S. A good example recently of the fight for collections versus the fight for space was at the New York Public Library, and maybe you all have been reading some of this. They, they recently ended plans uh, quite dramatically to move a large portion of the books held in stacks at the Schwartzman Building, which is the main research library on Fifth Avenue, you know, the one with the big lions. Um, they were going to move them to storage in New Jersey. And they were going to take over some of that vacant space for human occupancy. Now, while there were many reasons for the turnaround, the upshot is, is that the researchers wanted their collections close by. So different arrangements are being made for storage underneath Bryant Park, which is behind the, the, the main branch of the library. You know, that was very dramatic. But I think for the most part, libraries really have been shifting away from developing and maintaining physical collections, particularly journal titles and monographs that are published and distributed widely uh, and may also be available electronically. Um, libraries have been moving their collections off-site. And they're using what I'll call primary or prime real estate for more seating and service areas. Work is being done now to look, at, to look strategically at shared collection development and shared storage strategies of print collections to reduce costs and duplication of effort. But rest assured, in the preservation community, others are also working to ensure that original copies will also be preserved and made available for as long as possible. Along with collections, many tech services departments and other what I'll call non-public services have also been moved off-site. And maybe you all have experienced the same thing. And while it may not seem like a big problem in and of itself, if it happens to you, the risk here is that preservation may not be seen as, a, as central to the mission of the library organization in which it serves. So more effort is going to be, is, is uh, is going to need to go into keeping your staff and faculty engaged with preservation. So while preservation programs are evolving, as are the practitioners and the educational programs that train preservation specialists to care for library collections. So both things are changing, our educational programs and our departments. So traditional preservation, it focuses on physical collections, preventing damage by controlling the environment, careful storage and handling, attention to security, pest management, keeping the building in good condition, stabilizing books, um, uh, all that. You know, it's sort of you've got a pretty good sense, I think, by now, sort of everything that, that might make up a preservation program. Um, the problem is, is that right now the U.S. doesn't have a dedicated library school program for library preservation conservation since the program at the University of Texas, Austin, shut down. And I, I think they stopped accepting students in 2009. They didn't have funding to continue to support their program. So in the preservation field, especially working in the, in the professional environment, we're trying to work towards a solution to ensure that we have skilled practitioners entering this field. So we want students to study traditional book and paper conservation at, um, at a, a, you know, to, to a certain level. Um, right now, uh, we have students in established conservation degree institutions. Um, and what we're trying to do is get them to specialize in libraries by taking courses in accredited MSIS programs. So the conundrum professionally and in the library world right now is that the skill set for traditional approaches to library preservation is in so many respects quite different from digital preservation. I mean, simply stated, one relies on hand skills, you know, an understanding of material science, history, technology, manufacture, whereas the digital preservation librarian has to have a really deep knowledge of information systems and programming. And so they're very different. Um, and you're lucky you know, to get those strengths in, um, 
you know, both those strengths in, in one person. I think it's okay when you're thinking about your world and your organization and your work environment uh, to have a general approach, to have a leader uh, that emphasizes management uh, skills. Um, th this is a very workable solution, and it's really practiced by many larger libraries in the U.S. So you have someone who's like taking care of the overall program and then hire specialists to the handwork and to do the digital work underneath a, a, an umbrella. So in some, what, wherever your program was or is going or where it is, remember that really preservation is about managing and leadership and understanding what the options are and how they fit into your organizational needs and how they become part of your organizational culture. So I know you're all asking then, well, how do we do that? Well, let's just start by thinking a little bit more broadly. Programs really um, vary depending on factors such as the size of the library or the library system, the type of collections being managed, including digital assets, and the mission of the organization. Preservation activity could be focused in one department or it could be dispersed across many divisions. In a large organization, preservation is likely to be managed as a separate unit, such as, as it is where I work. But even here, preservation work is, is distributed. For example, acquisitions tries to purchase items that are sturdy and well-made. Cataloging updates our mark records to indicate that an item's been photocopied or that an e-copy is available instead. And circulation staff ensure that our materials are organized and well-maintained. If you don't have a central program, a dispersed program can work if you have good communication. It usually works best, though, if you have one high-level manager with overall responsibility for preservation efforts so that resources are expended wisely and the program has vision and cohesiveness. If you work across departments and divisions, you can collaborate according to your strengths and abilities. An integrated program is a successful program because mindfulness is part of everyone's routine and much damage can be prevented or minimized this way. It's important to tailor the scope and direction of the preservation program. That is, a large research library is going to concentrate on long-term maintenance of comprehensive collections with preservation of the information at the forefront. A special collection will try to keep materials in good condition by providing best possible storage and careful handling. So they're really focused on that, uh, that object rather than just the information. And then public libraries, I'm not sure if we have any public librarians with us today. Well, they probably know that the major cause of damage in their environment is heavy use. So you might concentrate on user education to extend the life of your materials. So in getting started, you really need to think about your service vision. These are some of the questions that your library um, we'll need to think about and discuss um, as you begin to think strategically about how you are going to organize and, and support preservation activities. So you want to ask how preservation fits into the work that you're doing. Do you have important research collections that you need to make available? Do you have legal obligations to maintain your collection? For example, if you have an archives. Also, what does your mission statement say? Does it state clearly that preservation is one of your imperatives? You need to look at what staff, finances, past practices, policies, and procedures are already in place. And think about what's working for you and what isn't. And what do you need to do in terms of administration to try to address some of those problems? Of course, you need to consider the condition of your building and the spaces where collections are stored and used also emergency planning and response activities. And just so you know, when I came into work this morning, I came into a flood environment where we moved thousands of books and put over 600, 600 books into freezers. And that's before today's webinar. So it's important that you have this be part of your plan. You want to consider in-house treatment um, and whether or not it's desirable to set up an in-house program. Um, or whether working exclusively with vendors or contracted services will meet your needs and expectations. 
And also think about your digital assets. What collections are you acquiring or creating that you hope to keep, and I know this is a scary word, forever? What do you know about best practices, and do you think you're meeting those baselines for quality? And you want to ask yourself, would an outside expert be one way of accurately gauging your digital preservation readiness? And where do you see yourself in two years or five years? What are your priorities going to be? So these are just a few questions to get you thinking, but there is a more structured way to do this analysis, and I know that's what you were hoping for. Okay. Well, let's see about getting started. A general preservation assessment is a good way to dissect the problem and look holistically at what you have, what you want, and what you need to do to reach your goals. A large research library may hire a full-time preservation administrator to do the analysis and organize a new program. Otherwise, many libraries will get in-house professionals to do what we call a self-review or self-survey using some of the written tools that are available. And this person is a good person to do the job as they'll know a lot about the history and workings of the organization. The problem is if you have in-house staff do these types of reviews, that, the, that there's a risk that their findings won't be considered expert enough or objective enough to rally support for the implementation of findings. An outside expert may cost more. They come in, they do the analysis, and they will submit to you a report of findings. And this is a great start. Um, there could be other studies, like a collection level condition analysis of a rare book collection, or a study of the building and the building systems. But these will come as a follow-up after you've done that general, general review. So this general assessment, you're going to get a report, but I want to remind you that it isn't a plan, but it should form the basis of one. And thinking about what is recommended, you have to ask yourself, well, what would have the most impact? What can I do now easily? And what do I need to plan for to do maybe a few years down the road? What are my priorities? What resources do I need in the next year or two or in the next 10 to implement those findings and start making significant inroads into collections protection at my institution? So what I'm talking about is preservation planning. I want to just give you a definition from the Northeast Document Conservation Center, where they say preservation planning is a process by which the general and specific needs for the collections are determined, priorities are established, and resources for implementation are identified. Its main purpose is to define a course of action that will uh, allow an institution to set its present and future preservation agendas. And in addition, it identifies the actions an institution will take and those it probably will never take so that their resources are allocated appropriately. So there you go in a nutshell. What I'm talking about is about preservation planning, about a process. It defines your course of action. It helps you define what you can do using your resources wisely and effectively. So in thinking about the findings of your reviews, is you're going to be looking at key items. This is a list that you want to come up with, with of high priority actions that are achievable with a timetable for implementing them. And your, your primary goal is really to come up with a, you know, a, a timetable that, that looks like this, you know, that says what, what it is that needs to be done and when you're going to do it and um, you're going to come up with resources and a plan to make each one of those happen. And, you know, this isn't something done by one person. This is done, you know, among several that can make the decisions and move things forward. Okay, now before we wrap up, I wanted to give you some what I'll call insider tips. Because uh, I've been working in this field uh, both as a conservator at, and as a preservation administrator since the late uh, 1980s. So first and foremost, if staff and administration don't know what preservation is or what you do or why it's important, they won't get on board and you won't get the needed administrative support you need to carry your program forward. 
So I'm saying toot your horn, educate staff, get involved at every opportunity to teach people about preservation issues. Do a really good job. Be excited about what you do. Get grant money and make a visible difference. Be a really good manager and an advocate. What have you done that's positive? What are the risks of inaction? But don't be a pill about it. Make friends everywhere. You likely won't be able to tell anybody what to do. Um, so you need to be persuasive. You need to know the cost of things. And do those statistics so you can prove your effectiveness. You've got to work to be an authority on all subjects, preservation related. You have to help where you can. You need to engage staff in all divisions, at all departments, at all levels, because preservation is part of everything, whether people know it or not. You will need allies in cataloging to update those records and in CERC to identify those damaged materials when they are returned, IT to help manage your institutional repository, and facilities when there's a flood or bugs. So get them on your side and work to keep them there. And whatever you do, even knowing that your service options are primarily services to the library, it's the patrons that you are ultimately looking to serve. Because without preservation, there is no access. Preservation and access are inextricably linked and always will be, whether you're protecting an old collection of leather-bound books or digitized copies of sound recordings. Preservation and access. OK, so I think we're just about right on time. Um, we're going to allow people for about 20 minutes or so um, to ask questions. And there is Thank you. go ahead, and there is a question <laughs> box for, for you to put in your, um, to put in your questions, and we'll be monitoring it. Great, thank you, Karen. Um, I, this is Vicki, the host, and um, I just want to have a, I'll, I'll get the ball rolling here, and I have one comment and one question. Um, my first comment is that I really, um, I think these are all really good tips, but uh, I especially like um, your emphasis on cross-training and, um, you know, really getting everyone involved because, you know, preservation issues, they affect every aspect of the library, like you said. Um, so I, I really like that. Um, just wanted to comment on that. Um, that tip. I, I think sometimes in libraries we can get very siloed, so I, it's very important to inform everyone. Um, but also my question is that you mentioned um, get grant money. Where would we find grant money? What are some potential sources for that, um, okay. for that kind of funding? Okay. There's a program called, um, uh, that's uh, under the National Endowment for the Humanities, and I think it's been going out for maybe five or eight years, I'm not sure exactly. It's a preservation assistance grant. They have quite a few programs, but that's the one you're going to be looking for. And that will award up to $5,000 to have uh, an outside consultant come in and do that general needs assessment. Um, some states do have uh, uh, programs that you can also apply for money. I know we do here in New York State. I'm aware of several others, so you can look to your state library for advice on that. Sometimes uh, regional centers will offer uh, scholarships or uh, subsidized support for preservation as assessments. So that's a good place to get started. OK, great. Um, if anyone in the audience has any questions, feel free to write them in in the question box. Uh, we still have plenty of time to take any questions, um, general or specific. Well, while we're waiting, I can say that here at the University at Albany, not only do we have a preservation department, which sometimes is risky because people see preservation as not their job because they have a department. Uh, but we also have a preservation committee to ensure that there's uh, sort of oversight and engagement across the libraries. And we only meet twice a year, but it's enough to bring everyone to the table uh, and, uh, and get their advice and input into how the program is running. Sure, sure. Um, we just got one question. Um, hello, great presentation. Can you talk a little bit more about hidden collections? 
hidden collections. Well, again, uh, there are there are there's grant funding out there now um, to expose these hidden collections. These are usually collections that haven't been cataloged, uh, haven't been organized. Um, that um, people want to uh, gain intellect intellectual access to and then provide usually digital access. A lot of the granting agents that are helping support hidden collections, uh, partly it's to get them digitized and uh, sort of improve online access but uh, expose these wonderful collections uh, and, and prove to people the value of what we might have in special collections and archives, what we might have um, for original unique material to understand maybe not everything is uh, an electronic, you know, isn't born digital or is a book. Um, if you have material that you try to get a handle on, I think it's the National Endowment that's been uh, providing some resources to get those hidden collections unearthed. I don't know if that answered the question. Okay. Well, it, if it didn't answer your question, feel free to ask a follow-up. Yes, please. Um, the next question that just came in is, how would staff conduct a self-survey if they don't know where to start organizing an archival collection? Oh, okay. Um, after, I'll, I'll just flip through here. Sorry. Um, there are, um, here on your screen, you can see the last, uh, this by Beth Patkis, Assessing Preservation Needs. This tool is online at no cost, and you can see it's a guidebook, and you can use that to go through and systematically, as a staff, ask the questions and look at what you have. So it, the first section is looking at staff and budget and policies, and then there's a section on storage, there's a section on environment, there's a selection on care and handling, exhibition. So it, it'll help you go through and do a self-analysis. Okay. Um, so the person who asked the first question said, yes, that does answer my question. Yeah. Um, okay, and good. he has a follow-up. For digital vendors, how do you select the most appropriate? Um, I, there, aren't, there aren't a lot of people, you mean a vendor to do the reformatting or a vendor to do a review of, or, I mean, or a service to do a review of your digital collections? I'm sorry. I want to make sure I understand. Sure, sure. Um, if you have any... Um, if you could answer that for us. If you're, if you're working with a vendor, then you should probably have a pretty good idea of what the quality standards are for whatever work you're having done, whether it's audio or a video or, um, or imaging. So um, there, there are resources out there, and we can, we, can, we can follow up with that to sort of give you what the guidelines are. Or maybe Wednesday, Peter will be covering some of that. Um, so if you're working with a vendor, you need to tell him what you want. So what's that high-end file going to look like? Do you want derivatives? How are the files being delivered to you? Who's doing what metadata, et cetera? Um, you may not have to know everything because I have a lot of respect for vendors, and they know a lot, and they may also be able to help guide you, but you need to know what you want if you want assurance that you're doing it well. Right. Um, okay, so another follow-up. Um, when you ask vendors to provide imaging, digital voice equipment for digital preservation, do you have a formula for selection based on price, recommendations, technical requirements, etc.? Um, well, usually, you know, you're coming up with some kind of request for proposal. So you're asking, you know, you're, you know what the deliverables are, what kind of files you're expecting to get back, and in what form, and what kind of metadata should be done, and what kind of co quality control there's going to be. Um, you, you certainly are free and probably advised to go to a couple of different vendors to see what you get back, and, uh, and be prepared to maybe talk to some of your colleagues about where you think you've got, you know, what vendor you think would be the best to work with. I, again, you know, I always recommend that you, you, you call your state library or maybe institutions, larger institutions in your region, um, talk to the people that are doing the work now. If it's something new to you, uh, I think you'll find that there's always somebody in your state or even your city 
that has experience that can help guide you to a respectable, responsible vendor. Okay, and the follow-up comment for that was, I think talking to colleagues is important. Sounds good. Thanks for your workshop today. Oh, very good. Okay. Not a question. <laughs> and, and, does anyone else in the audience have any questions? And, and I can say also, you know, people call me asking questions, and, and I, I, I'm often surprised, you know, and I just say, wow, that's a great question. I have no idea. And um, th th there, there aren't a lot of preservation specialists in the United States, and we're all kind of connected. We, you know, we know who we are. And we are very, um, we're a really cool, happy group, and we're always asking each other questions. We're always reaching out for advice. So if you don't know, I mean, that's okay. Somebody will get the right answer for you. So if you can contact me or, you know, contact somebody in your area who's a preservation specialist, if they don't know, they can usually help find the information you need. Excellent. Um, any other questions for the audience? We still have time for a few more questions, if anyone has any. All righty. Well, um, I think, um, Vicki, um, that you've been a great hostess. Thank you very much. I think we can wrap it up as long as everyone knows that um, you've got my email. Uh, it's up here on the screen. Uh, if there's anything that comes in after the fact to the Alex office or to me directly, uh, we're happy to help out and to answer any questions that you might have. And I encourage everyone to try to attend Julie Mosbo's program tomorrow on the environment uh, and Peter Verhaen's uh, webinar on Wednesday afternoon, which will be about digital preservation, an introduction to. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Karen. Um, I just have a few quick things um, as far as wrap-up goes. Um, and I will switch to my screen here. OK. Um, so that was today's presentation. Um, and as Karen just mentioned, here are some of the more specific details on the next two library preservation um, today sessions. I know most of you have signed up for all three, so that's really great. They're all kind of meant to go together. Um, so tomorrow, same time, environmental monitoring, monitoring and control, and also then on Wednesday, preserving digital collections and overview. Um, so that is what's coming up next in this uh, virtual pre-conference session. Um, and if you would like to register, you can go to the ELEX website, and um, it's a pretty easy process. Our next, um, I'd also like to mention for those of you who are in the Las Vegas area or who will be attending the ALA Annual Conference this year, um, we, the ELEX office is running three pre-conferences. We have one pre-conference that is um, a day and a half. It is based on the Fundamentals of Collection Assessment. It's a, it's a very um, condensed version of the Fundamentals of Collection Assessment course that we run. Um, and it will be presented by Rita Sinha and Corey Tucker. Uh, you do not have, and I'd like to note that if you are not attending the conference, you can still attend the pre-conferences um, so that you don't have to go to both. Um, so that is, that is one of them, June 26th and June 27th. We have another pre-conference on June 27th as well. It's all day called Statistics and Reports, Data-Driven Decision-Making. And that will be presented by Michael Levine Clark and Beth Bernhardt. And finally, we have one more half-day one about streaming media. Streaming media passes the tipping point. Now what? This will be by, presented by Doug Farrelly, Kirk Blankenship, and Jessica Hammond. So we have um, quite a bit uh, going on at ALA, the ALA Annual Conference. And for those of you in the audience, if you um, have any further questions, feel free to contact Karen. Um, if you have any general questions about Alex offerings, feel free to contact us at the Alex office. And if you have any ideas for future webinars or future um, virtual pre-conferences, 
please contact uh, Rita Sinha or Becky Ryder. Uh, they'd be happy to take your ideas and, um, you know, to plan f future events like this. Um, so with that, I'd also like to thank um, Iping Chen Gaffey from, um, for helping us with technical support today and um, the support that our technical support um, volunteers provides makes it possible for us to present these webinars smoothly. And I'd like to thank you all in the audience again for joining us today, and we hope you participate in other Alex webinars and continuing education offerings in the future. Have a great afternoon.